So hello everyone. Not that much of us, not that many of us today here, but in any way, I have uploaded lectures for today in the section files, lecture four. So please download it. I didn't do it yesterday. So today we are going through remote control, let's say. So we're going to connect to some remote machine, which will not be actually remote. It will be our own machine, but a different user. But we will do it in the same way as we connect to a remote server. So first of all, please open your Docker containers that we created, where we were playing with our tasks previously. So for those who are new here, who just, let's say, signed, in the last minute, we are using Ubuntu, latest Ubuntu image, but you don't have to have, if you have Linux machine or if you have Windows with so called WSL installed, it is okay. I believe this WSL in Windows, it contains actually SSH client. So Today we're going about so-called secure shell. We are going to connect to remote shell for a special protocol. We are not covering this protocol. We're just playing with the tool. <clears throat> so let me find our container. So here we are. We are in root user because we are in a Docker container and we need to set up a remote connection. So first of all, we need to create a new user. For example, user add, and let's type some SSH user name. This is where we will actually be connected. Remote user name is SSH user, but remote machine is actually our local machine. And we additionally pass flag minus M just to create home folder. Please do this step. This command simply creates a new user, adds a new user in the system and creates, with help of this flag minus M, it creates its home folder where it usually creates it. And since we are root user, we can do anything. <clears throat> now we need to do the following. We need to set up a password for this user. There is other option, passwordless access, but we will cover it shortly. That, but for now, let's try setting a password. So we we'll just use command, which is password. It changes your password. And we are changing password for SSH user. It asks us, asks us for a new password, but if there is already a password, it will ask it, it will ask us old password. But since we just created a user with no password, it is okay. So let us type something very simple. For example, one. Since it is Docker local machine. We can use such easy password, but never use it anywhere else. This is just for practice. And type it once again, just one. One symbol, which is easy to type and fast. Okay, password updated successfully. So for those who just came, we came back to our Docker container, called command user add, then username, and then minus M flag, this creates us new user and creates home folder for this user. We call this command, which changes password. And now we are ready to actually to log in to that user remotely, although it is local. And to do this, we have SSH command, secure shell, and we need to type SSH user, username, and then where so at localhost so localhost is a default name for local machine when your user is here uh, 
Unfortunately, it says that something is not working. And the reason is there is no SSH server in this Docker instance. We need to install SSH server. This can be done with the help of apt install. Open SSH server. Let me check it. Yes, so I already installed it, but nevertheless, you have to install it at first. So this is the command in yellow, apt install open SSH server. This server will allow you to connect to this machine. And then later, just do whatever you would like to do. So please raise a hand if you uh, do not follow this and you need to repeat some steps. So everything is fine, I believe. Yes. If you leave password empty, just press enter, it will not work. If you do not change password, you will not be able to connect. Empty password means there is no access by password. That's it. You need to type at least one symbol. We will, we will actually manage to do passwordless access without password, but later a little bit. So now we do service start service, then service SSH and start. This is the comment. So we're starting service on our machine that will listen to all the connections, remote connections, and allow access to our local users. But we will not use any external connections. We just land within our Docker image. which is by default installed in such a way and configured such a way that you have access to the outside internet, but outside internet doesn't have access to your local machine, to your Docker container. That's why we're using very simple password here. So for those who just arrived, please ask others, what are the comments that were typed and then proceed. So service is up now, up and running. And what we need to perform is just once again, try to connect. So it was SSH, then username, add, and host name. Normally you provide your username instead of SSH user, and you provide name of the remote with .ru or .com, whichever server it is. And now it asks for a password. So I use password, just one, enter. That's it, I am inside. You didn't see anything here when I type my password because well, it is secure shell and it hides all the information. So I am inside. What can I do to prove that I'm inside? Let's call bash and so once again, we are inside our Docker instance. At first, we create new user with help of a comment user add. Once user is created, we set password for this user. Very simple password because we are playing in a sandbox and nothing will happen with us. Then we install OpenSSH server. After it is installed, we start this service for us, service start. And finally, to connect, we use SSH and then this is how common looks like. Username, add, host name. Local host is the default name for your local machine. You can, let's say, <clears throat> install several instances of Docker that will listen to SSH on different ports, and then you can have access to different machines actually, to, to different Dockers. But here, when I'm doing this, we are following simple way. So after we do this, we have password to enter. And after entering password correctly, we're inside. So as I type bash, I see here SSH username. So who am I? I am a SSH user. And what is the machine? It is this, so let me scroll a little bit. Before I was a root user at this machine. Let's copy this and just echo here. 
So you see that numbers here and numbers later were the same. So we are on the same machine. And U name minus A tells us that we are on the same machine. This is the name of our host. Although we already did SSH connection. So we just connected to the local user. Okay. Next step is to set up passwordless access. So how to have passwordless access? It will be done in the same way as we did it with GitHub when we connected. We created SSH key. We uploaded public. So this command SSH key again, it generates us two files. One file is for private use. One file is for public use. Public file, we upload it to GitHub. We do the same here. We upload this public something to a proper place in SSH user home folder. So where am I? This is home folder of the SSH user. At first, at first, let's create folder called .ssh. We will need it. All the magic for the SSH happens in this folder. So we create directory. By default, it is not created, but all the magic files will appear in this folder. And now we can get out. To get out, you can simply press Ctrl D or type exit. Type it once again since we actually launched Bash. Connection to localhost closed. Now we are back to our root user. Now we would like to create passwordless access to remote server. As you remember, we on a previous uh, lecture, we created SSH key and it is located in. We changed directory to root directory because this home folder for the root user. Inside, we created .ssh folder, here it is. And uh, inside that folder, we have different keys. So I have played with it and I have generated yesterday more keys just to play with it. But we generated these two files. So ID RSA is just default name for the key, which is generated with encryption type RSA. Okay, now all we need is pass this ID RSA pub to the SSH user somehow. And there are two ways. So first way <coughs> is just to, let's say, since we are on the same machine, we simply cut this file, this public file, and append it. Okay, let's just rewrite. SSH for uh, corresponding file in the SSH folder of the SSH user. So this is where we need to take a look. So this command just prints contents of a public key into a file in this folder, and it is called authorized keys. So the name as it appears here, authorized keys. So all the keys, public keys that appear in this file, they will be actually used for the authorization, passwordless authorization. So please do this command. So this command, once again, it copies your public key into a special file, which is called authorized keys. It contains all the keys that are authorized to for passwordless access. And since we are going, yes. This is a special name indeed. So you cannot have mistakes in this file name when you copy your key. I believe everything is fine. Yes. Yes, so 
um, some of you didn't create .ssh folder in the user, SSH user. So let me repeat how we did it. We did SSH, as you see, didn't ask password now, but for you, it will ask password. Then I did make dir .ssh. Oh, it is not a bash, but it's SSH, so make dir minus p dot ssh minus p simply tells you if this folder is already there do nothing if it is not there create it and there is this dot ssh folder it is created then we get out like pressing ctrl d and then we copy authorized uh, public key into a set of authorized keys okay questions So it is already there for me. And as you saw, doing SSH is very simple now. I have no need to enter password. And I'm inside and once again, who am I? I am an SSH user on the same local machine. So let us press Control D, Control D and I closed this connection. I am again a root user, and I would like to actually try other way of copying public key because usually when you cannot copy it like that, you are not you are always not a root user. You cannot simply write to some folder on a remote server. So how can we do it? Let us remove this file now. Remove home. SSH user, dot SSH, authorized keys. I am removing it. Let us try SSH again and it asks for a password. Okay, we're not entering password. I just pressed Control C and I got out of entering password. Other possible way to copy it is to Let me just, uh, there are other ways, several ways. And one of the possible ways is so-called secure copy. So as usually we copy files with help of CP command and source into target. This is standard how we copy it. It tells us that there is no source file. Okay, but for us, we will be using SCP. So it is secure copy. It will be copying through SSH protocol. So what is the source? Source is .ssh id rsa.pub. We copy this file into remote server, which is SSH user at localhost. And we just copy this file into root into home folder. So secure copy local file to a remote server where I connect by username, localhost. It will actually ask for my password because there is no authorized key in there. And I will copy into home folder. I'm entering password. That's it, it is copied. So the key is there. All I need to do is to log in and extend my authorized keys file. Let us do it. SSH user at localhost. Bash. And now we just copy this file. Here it is. And we need to concatenate it into authorized keys. So we cut this file into .ssh and then once again, we need to type properly this file without uh, typos. So we're concatenating everything inside this file into proper file that is used to, for passwordless access. Let us cut this file that everything is fine. Yes, so our key 
is written inside. Yes. Sorry. Do you mean copying from the root user outside connection? This? So before that, I copied file itself on the remote server. So SCP copies your local file to remote server or remote file to a local server, to, to your local machine. In this way, I'm copying local file, yes. This is what you do. You copy your password. You, you copy your public encryption key in the remote server. You can actually swap these parameters more or less and copy something from the remote server to your local machine the same way. Currently, we're not connected. We are root user, so here let us define. Root user means that we are on our local machine. When we see SSH user, we're on a remote connection. Name of the host or IP address, indeed, yes. So generally you need to put, put proper host name or IP address here. But in our case, we're using local host. So we, once again, we copy this public key into a list of authorized keys. It is done. And now we can log out, press Ctrl D twice. And we are out of our, uh, we are back to our local machine. We are once again on a root user. So let us try connecting again and it didn't ask for password. So some of you experience so-called permission denied problem. And the reason is that folder called SSH folder so here it is, .ssh must have the same owner as the user itself. So you can take a look at So here it is, .ssh folder, what are the permissions? For the .ssh folder, ssh user must be the owner, not root. It means that at first you need to log in, create this folder, and then only uh, do something. Otherwise, if the owner is not root user, then it's just a problem. Uh, if the owner is the root user, you have no access to this folder. You are not allowed to write something inside or delete something. So this way, we just copied file. This way, we can copy many, many, many files with help of SCP. Where it is. So if you would like to copy lots of files, you can do a wildcard. For example, copy everything from .ssh folder or copy recursively entire folder on the remote server. This way we copy files to a remote server. You can have your own archive. You can zip all your files, then copy with a single zip archive, then unzip on a remote server. Or you can use SCP with minus R or dash R option to do it recursively for you if all the files are in a single folder. Or you can just copy everything here in this folder. Your entire home folder will be copied. But we're not going to do this now, at least. So let us try other way 
of copying our uh, public key. Let us remove old key, first of all. We are root user, we can remove anything on any user. So once again, we remove home SSH user dot SSH authorized keys. We remove it. So there is no such file anymore and we cannot get access to the remote system without a password. We need a password. Other way is to actually call SSH and uh, add additional parameters. So SSH, uh, SSH user at local host, and then a command that you would like to execute. Let's us just list all the files on the remote server. So soon we will get how to copy with help of this uh, syntaxes, how to copy our public key into proper authorized keys file. It asks for a password, I enter it, it's just one. And I see the answer. So it tells me, it just prints me all the information about remote server. Not all the information, but whatever you ask. I ask to list all the files in home folder. And as you remember, we copied this file to a home folder. So I see it now. So how can we use this syntax? This syntax can be used with help of pipe. So previously we were talking about pipelining when output of one command becomes input for the next command. Let us just remind it. Uh, so we have, for example, we can have this file and we pass it into a grab because we are looking for some uh, we are looking for public key with uh, username root, and we see it here, so it is highlighted. So this is pipelining symbol, when standard output of one command becomes standard input for the next command. So next command can be SSH command. Actually, you know what, let me do it like that. So after we launch SSH command and list all the files, I would like to see if there is .ssh file inside. So grab .ssh. So this is escaping sequence such that this dot is not treated as any symbol, but as just ordinary dot. So I entered password and I see one line. Indeed, there is such a folder .ssh and its uh, owner is the user itself. So how to use this pipe? It can be actually done very easy. So we concatenate or print the standard output, our file that we would like to copy, that we would like to actually paste inside authorized keys. So this creates a pipe between two machines, local machine and remote machine. And on remote machine, once we actually connect to it, we call concatenate or everything standard, concatenate standard input into a file called .ssh authorized keys. It asks for a password, that's it. So. This is the command. So first part is to put contents of the public key onto standard output, which is then piped. It becomes standard input for the next command, and the next command executes this command in uh, this command on a remote server. So we execute this on the remote server, provided with the input with the standard input. It can continue standard input and all the files, but we see here no files and outputs to this file. Yes.
because there is such a symbol and if this symbol is not inside quotes it will be treated as run this connect to the remote server run command cut and then output everything of this command into a local file this is why you need to execute this entire comment on remote machine. And this greater symbol just breaks this comment into a smaller part. Just cut will be executed. Cut alone on a remote server. So let us check if authorized keys actually is there. So we list home SSH user dot SSH. And we see here authorized keys so if i try to ssh to the remote server ssh user at localhost ah sorry there is a typo here in the username so we connect to ssh user at localhost and it does not ask for password once again so first way we used scp for secure copy then we connected to the remote server and did everything there explicitly second approach used pipelines and the uh, entire public key went into a pipe and this output was copied to remote server and then executed so a certain command was executed provided with our input let us once again remove this file authorized keys and copy it other way third way since we are root user, we can simply remove this file. So we are removing this key again, this file. And we list all the files inside .ssh folder. So there is no such file anymore. So the last command to copy your public key is SSH copy ID command. It will connect to remote server and copy the key that you just point to properly. Let us take a look at what, what are the parameters. So there is very nice parameter, minus N or dash N, dry run. In many situations, there is such a parameter, dry run parameter in many terminal commands where it will just tell you what it will do without doing anything. It will just type what, shall, what it will do if you remove minus N. So we have here, here what we need. We need to copy a certain identity file because I have generated several of them. I don't want to copy all of them. I would like to copy only a single identity file. And then that's it, user at hostname. So this is how it shall look like. SSH, copy ID, ID, minus N for the dry run, just to print us something, minus A, idrsa.pub, <coughs> because this is the file that we would like to copy. And then standard thing for the SSH, SSH user at localhost. <coughs> I need to actually type its full path. Dot SSH. Let me. Yes, it works like that. So this is the command. We copy ID. We copy our identity key file. The file itself is idrsa.pub, which is default name. We copy it to the remote server, which is, of course, local in current situation. And this parameter minus n tells us that this is a dry run. So SSH copy ID tells us all this story. So source key to be installed. Here it is. It will copy this file. OK. <clears throat> so it tells us that there is one key to be installed and it will be installed. And this is actually key. Not so interesting, let us remove minus N. 
option and just copy, perform the copy. So this key is now installed. Let us check. Uh, we need it first to enter password one, yes. So the key was copied and now we can actually do the SSH. SSH user at local host. So previously for this command, we had to type our password. Now we're trying just to connect to the remote server. And now it doesn't ask anything. So the last way is the most safe way. There are different options for you. And the last one is the most safe and let us concatenate uh, .ssh authorized keys. Here it is. Even if there is no such folder like .ssh, it will create it for you with proper permissions. Actually, let us take a look at permissions. So you see authorized keys here. This is the permission. It simply tells that nobody except the user itself has access to it. While previously, when we created this file, everyone had access to it, I believe. Not everyone, but at least our group had access to it. Our group could read it. Probably I can find it somewhere by scrolling. Let me. There was authorized keys, indeed. Here it is. Previously, it was like that. So anyone could read our authorized keys. So the proper way, since it is meant for secure connections and so on, it is better to keep your keys safe, even if they are public. <clears throat> so here, how it was, your group could read and write, even write into your authorized keys. So it means that any user in your group could just add something and then connect as you, while all other, users, all other users, they could read it. Now, restrictions or permissions are actually restrictive. Nobody can, except you, can take a look at your file. And probably when I created .ssh folder, I also didn't change properly permissions, but it's not a big deal usually. So now we have established in a different ways our passwordless access. So what can we do else? Uh, okay, so now we're talking about not only connecting, but also forwarding some ports or data through our connection. Why do we need it? Let me open. So this is the file that is already uploaded on the files section of Canvas, and you can find it. This is lecture notes. SSH forwarding, very interesting stuff because in many situations when you will do your work with your supervisors or in other projects, in many situations you will have to connect to remote server where so-called Jupyter notebook is running. So Jupyter Notebook is basically a visual browser representation for your Python code. You can launch your Python code from a browser. So how does it work? This is your local machine, your host. And you connect to a remote host. And that remote host contains very large amount of computational resources where you can actually compute instead of your local machine and you connect to it. On this remote host, there is a service, a web, web service running. It is called Jupyter Lab. And it, by uh, connecting properly to a certain port of this remote server, you will see just a web page. However, since you are not on a remote host directly, you cannot see this web page. So what I mean is the following. 
while on your local host, if you are actually, if you know what is Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook, you can simply type in your terminal Jupyter Notebook. It will launch browser for you. It will, first of all, start web service that will listen to certain port like 8888 or something similar. And you will have browser access to this port. You will simply type in your browser local host 8888. As you see, there is something in here, but there is no connection because this service is not up and running right now. If I will launch it, we will see here some web browser, uh, something where we could edit Python code. So generally when you connect to a remote server uh, that has this uh, Jupyter lab up and running, you would like to connect to it and to use resources of the remote machine. To have this working, you need to use SSH with proper flag. What it tells you, it will create a tunnel from your local host port 123 into a remote host with port 456. So everything in this picture is pretty nice. You see by colors that you connect to the remote host. So SSH to the remote host, which is this color yellow brown and then you would like on this server where is Jupyter lab or some web service running and it assumes that it can be accessed only from local host local host meaning locally and from the remote host it is visible as local host that's why we're saying that anything that tries to connect to our local port one two three is redirected to the to something that is visible from the remote host by name, local host and port 456. So if Jupyter Lab is running on the remote host on the port 8888, then, okay, if Jupyter Lab is running on the remote host on port 456 and I connect locally to the port 123, I, I don't know how to make it large here, to be honest. Surflet. So I'm connecting to local host, double colon, one, two, three. So I'm connecting to local host at port one, two, three. This connection will be redirected from my local host and it will go through SSH tunnel and it will actually listen to whatever web browser or whatever web service is given to me. <clears throat> so let us try this. So what I'm going to do now is to create this SSH tunnel, start listening on the remote machine, and then try to read something from the local machine. So we disconnect from the remote server, from SSH connection, <clears throat> and we do it like that, SSH minus L, now we tell what is the port number. For example, we would like to local port number. Let us say that local is 9999 for It will be redirected to something that is read something on the remote server that is local host at port 9898. And uh, actually, you know what? Let us try it like that. Probably it will work, I don't know. So I'm trying to redirect whatever connection from 9999 goes to redirect to HTTPS port, which is 443 at the google.com. I don't know if it will work because uh, there is a problem with a certificate because HTTPS stands for a secured connection and it requires, let's actually try 80 here and now we connect at local host. So if now, so this is it. So if now on the local machine, on the local machine, I try to read something from port 9999, it will actually, it will be redirected to this. 
it will go through the tunnel and then ask for this address. So let me open another terminal in external window. So now let us type bash. I am a root user. I'm a local machine. Let's with help of this command try to get uh, local host port 9999. So on my local host, I'm trying to read this port 99. I see something which is related to google.com, but it tells that's an error and so on. This is the problem that connection is not secured. It tells us there is no such page like HTTP google.com. There is, if you change HTTP into HTTPS, which is secured HTTP, it will work. But this one, it doesn't work. This is what we see here. So this, all this data, it went through, it was actually grabbed by our remote server, which is SSH user. It was tunneled, oh, where is it? It was grabbed by the remote server. It was tunneled through the, through this connection. And then I have read it finally on my port, local port. This is actually what we did. With the same command, with the same SSH command, we were connected to faraway host. This way, if you have, let's say, some server in Germany and you connect to it, with help of this command, you can always get access to certain websites that are not visible here in Russia. One of the possible VPNs, let's say, but this VPN will never be banned because, uh, well, uh, VPNs are usually banned on a different scale. When lots of users are connecting to the same IP address, this is how providers understand that this is the VPN. But if you connect to some computational resources of some university, nobody will ban them. And this way you have access to external websites and so on. So next possibility is to actually have a different tunnel that goes on a different, in a different way. So at first we were forwarding our local port and it, will, it was going, so our local port minus L forward local, our local port was going to something external. Other way is to forward something on the remote server to our, to our machine. This is this used in much less situations and uh, there is no interest in covering that. But if, this is pretty simple. If you connect to remote host and this remote host is, uh, it has lots of uh, restrictions. You cannot get access to some websites. You cannot get access to the web itself. But you need to download something, for example, or get to read some page from that remote server. Then you will have to do this tunnel. So I assume that your remote host only accepts SSH connections and cannot go to the web. With help of this command, you give it a hint and show how to get access to certain website, which is localhost at port 456. Of course, instead of localhost, you can use other website. So the same story works in opposite direction. From the remote server, which could be some supercomputer, which doesn't have access to external world, you can actually bypass some data or something similar. So, and you can, yes, so main idea of this SSH minus L command is actually to make it possible to work with computational resources of the remote server. You connect, you connect to your local host 888 port, it will be redirected to something on the remote server where certain web service is running and you will see this web service and you can use it. Standard web service is Jupyter Notebook, which will be, you will be using, I believe, in future. Okay, there is other kind of tunnel, which is called SOX proxy. It is not presented in lecture notes, so it is pretty simple. Okay, I need to type. I need to increase size. 
So I disconnect. After I disconnect it, this port forwarding is not working anymore. So I'm trying to read local host at port 99999, and we see nothing happened. There is an error. Simply because there is no port forwarding, there is no web service on our port 9999 anymore. So other thing that I know and uh, is minus D. It creates so-called SOX proxy for you, another way to create your own VPN. And now you type um, some port. So idea is it creates, uh, so it maps your port 8888 here as a proxy. All the data will go through, so you just need to tell your commands that there is so-called SOX proxy at local host and this port, and all the data that knows how to go through SOX proxy will be actually packed in a certain way. It will go to this port, and then it will be visit, and you will be reading all the data as if you're on a remote server, just like in this situation. But it's not like only one website is visible. No, everything is visible on outside. So let us also do it like that. So now we have this option, minus D. We have created certain port forwarding or data forwarding for port 8888. And now we need just to Um, let me understand how it works. So probably there is uh, SOX, I don't remember, SOX 5, local host. Okay, so let us... Okay, now it works, so finally. So this is the comment I, that I typed in a separate standalone terminal. Here, I'm a root user. I have connected in a different terminal window. I have connected to the remote server and I have created this port forwarding or SOX proxy at port 8888. Now I'm telling that Curl will just read this website, try to connect to it, try to read it, and you see actually here HTML web page. This is what it read. I'm telling this curl to connect to the server google.com, which is HTTPS here, so it also sends secure data um, with help of SOX proxy, and this SOX proxy is here. If you tell your browser, if you're on your local machine, Linux machine, for example, and you do this SSH connection with forwarding of the, with the proxy forwarding, and you tell your local web browser that there is SOX5 proxy located at this address, you can get, you can read external, uh, you can read external web. So this is another kind of VPN, which is also not tracked. It will never be banned. You just need to have resources on the external websites, uh, on external machines. You need to go into settings of your browser, tell that there is a proxy. If there is an option of SOX proxy, you need to choose SOX proxy and then type this address. It is really helpful if you are, let's say, on some conference, and you need to fill in something on Gosus Lugi, which is for some reason, for, for unknown reason, not visible outside Russia. So you do this connection. Now Gosus Lugi works even without VPN. You don't have to connect to any VPN. And what you do is you connect to a local server, which is located here in Russia, if you have access to such a machine. And then all your traffic, web traffic, will be going through your proxy, through your 
secured connection and nobody will see actually what are you asking for and so on. And Gosuslogi will think that uh, you're asking this website to be downloaded uh, here in Russia. So there is no problem for that. You can actually, if some of you have already access to some computational resources outside Russia, you can try this and you will have your own free VPN. You can get some free, I don't know if you can get free Amazon web cloud right now. Uh, probably somehow you can do it. And then you will see. So you have very slow machine on the on that end because free tier Amazon cloud is just single core machine with let's say 500 megabytes and so on, but this is enough for SOX proxy and you will have your own free VPN. Okay, let's have a 10 minute break.
Okay, let's get back. So finally, we can <coughs> get access to our local machine without password. We can tunnel our connections to external web servers. And finally, we can launch something, some work on the remote server. Done. Now we would like to actually connect graphically. But there is an option for that. But we will not cover it fully. So in addition to all the flags like minus L, minus R, and minus D, there is an option while, which is minus X. It stands for forward X server commands. So what is X server? X server is graphical user, user interface on Linux machines. There are different implementations, but protocol is X11. So where is the special protocol how to draw your graphical user interface? Instead of drawing it on your local machine, you can actually, instead of launching some graphical program on your local machine, it is possible to launch graphical program on remote machine and get some picture, get some buttons, graphical user, and so on. So with help of this, you will connect and all the commands for the X server for, from the remote, they will be transferred to your local machine. It means that you need to have so-called X server up and running on your local machine. It is by default working on Linux. On Mac OS, you can install so-called X quartz. It will actually tell you that you need to install something. And for the Windows, I do not know exactly how it goes. But if you are on Linux machine with a possibility on Ubuntu, for example, with graphical interface and so on, and you're connecting to some Linux machine and you run, you just connect with SSH minus X, and then you run gedit, which is graphical edit or GNU edit, GNOME edit, it will launch visual graphical tool for you just to edit text. But since we're in a Docker environment where our Docker doesn't support anything visual, we're not doing this. So just remember, there is an, a possibility to forward all the drawings from the remote server to your local server. And for this, you need to use minus X option. Okay, this is the last part about forwarding. Now we're going to do to learn how to copy files. Uh, sorry. Now we are going to simplify our work with SSH. It is writing SSH config. So last time we had to use um, certain commands like port forwarding and so on. But you remember that when you connect to certain remote server, you always need to forward a port. You always need to pass certain commands. You know exactly which a uh, key, which um, private key shall be used. Let us take a look at my dot conf uh, config file. So this config file is located at dot SSH folder. You won't have it right now, but we will create it. So this is how it looks on my side. It tells that I previously played with it and created it. So when I type SSH Docker, this is the host. I'm saying I would like to connect securely to the Docker. Here it is. And it will substitute everything for me. User, user one. So this SSH Docker is equivalent to, as you see, I have connected. So this SSH Docker, it is equivalent to SSH user one at remote machine, which is host name at local host with port 22, so minus P22, because 
in many situations, your SSH server does not listen to default port. It will listen to some other port. It is just defined like that. Default is 22, but you can use any other, like 2200. If there is already SSH server running for someone, and you would like to run SSH server inside Docker, Docker cannot listen to the same port as your local machine. It will listen to different port. But this is it. So it will substitute minus P22 and minus I identity file user one. So it is it connected. Let me try to remove this config file. So rem with SSH config, because I believe that it just took everything from there. Again, I didn't need to use anything. I am using SSH key with a not default name, which is user one. It is different. And you might have different keys for different remote servers. I am connecting to port 22. It can be also different. But I am connecting to my user at local host. So config is to just to simplify life for you. SSH Docker and all the parameters are inside. You don't have to remember them all the time. You just once create such a config file for every remote server or for a bunch of remote servers. Let us create such a config file once again. So it is .ssh config. This is how it is called. And to be true, to be honest, Vim sees that this is a config file in .ssh folder, and it knows how to highlight syntaxes for you. So host, let's say SSH user. I will. This is how I call it. You can call it any way. It can have no relation to real username and real machine. You can just give it a second name. So user, here it is, SSH user. Host name is localhost. Port is 22, which is default. And identity file. is .ssh. And here, previously, I was using SSH key for user one. But now, since we generated everything for a new user, SSH user, it is just ID RSA. We didn't rename it. Let us now save and queue it from Vim. If you don't remember, it is you press escape, you, you press double colon, W for write or save file and queue. queue it. We will save file and queue it. Let's cut its contents now. So here it is. To connect to the to this configuration, we just need to do SSH to the SSH user because this is how it is called here. And now we are here. Type bash. And we see that we are at SSH user. So all the parameters, they were read. Let us now rename our key from IDRSA to something different. Because simply because you might have many different identity files. So we move dot SSH IDRSA into let's say dot ssh and new key so question is can we do this ssh connection now no such file this is what we see no such identity file and it asks for a password of course we can enter with password but we would like to set up passwordless access so we edit our config file. 
and change this key name to new key. This way, you just set up configuration once, set a name for your key, which is sometimes meant only for a single machine, and you work with it. You live with it, everything is fine. And the SSH, uh, SSH user now connects without a problem. Could I please repeat last comment? This. So this is the last version of SSH config. I changed only one line, identity file name, because I renamed it. Its corresponding public key is already in authorized keys. It is already in file. Home SSH user dot SSH authorized keys. Here it is, public key that corresponds to our new key, private new key. It is already here, so we experience no problems. If you have many different computational services, you can just give different names: service one, service two, and so on. So SSH config is not there for you. You need to create it yourself. I'm just, you create it, in a, for example, using Vim, which is what I did. Concatenating its contents is here. Now we would like to add some VPN option here. So I'm editing it once again. As far as I remember, it's dynamic forward. Dynamic forward on this port. We already tried, tried it with option minus D. So I just added a single line, dynamic forward, 8888. And now every time I connect to this remote server, I have some sort of VPN or proxy. And I can get, I can read external web. If I have uh, external uh, user, external remote host. So let us try it again. So. We are not connected, so no connection. Once again, we try to read website HTTPS google.com with this SOX proxy, but we did not start our connection. SSH, SSH user, cannot assign requested address. Oh, it could be that I need to use uh, option for IP4. Let us try it again. At least it works here. This curl command, it works. So I successfully read this website. This problem here, it simply tells us that we need to pass. <sighs> this error will go away if we pass additional flag. Mm. Minus four. It stands for use only IP version four. I hope you know what it is. Now there is no such error. The error by itself is simply that Docker cannot properly work with IPv6 address. I don't know why and so on. Don't ask me, but solution to this problem is just to enforce using IP version four with very limited amount of IP addresses. And let's do it once again, indeed. I can read this file. Let's try other, I don't know if it will work. Hmm, interesting, it doesn't, it does not.
at least Gososlugi works. I believe Yandex somehow understands this is just a curl and it ignores it. Instead of being normal browser, it just sees who is asking for data. And since curl is asking, it just sends nothing. This is what can be happening. Or it just rejects connection. But Gososlugi ignores your browser. So when you type something in your browser, browser tells a remote server, who is it asking for data? Is it Safari? Is it Microsoft Internet Explorer and so on? This way, curl is also telling something that I'm curl. Please get, give me data. At least go to sluggy work. Okay. And as we stop connection, I pressed Ctrl D, closed connection. This forwarding shall not work anymore. Indeed, it doesn't work. So there is no proxy on my local host. In the config file, you can actually do certain things. Let's copy. And now I can say that I would like to connect to some server, something at dot SSH user. Some subset of web services. It will also work. It will actually, mm, if here, in Skulltech, you have different computational resources, clusters, Jares supercomputer. You can type different hosts. But this way, you need to remove host name because it is not, it will be different. You can use, let's say, for all the, for all the, computational resources that are allocated in Skulltech, you can use the same user name, the same identity file, and you can additionally add always dynamic forwarding. But host name will be different, of course, because host name already contains host here. Let us actually leave it like that and try to do SSH one dot SSH user shall it work yes it works so i'm connecting although i typed this server i can use other server server too i'm also connecting but in, in reality i'm connecting to the same server simply because i provided the same host name if i remove it then host name will be read as it is written here this uh, host this name will be assumed as a host name that's why usually that's why usually host name in such situations is commented out, but you have the same username, the same identity file, the same port, and the same additional properties like dynamic forwarding. Okay, now we'll let, let's copy files. I already presented you in the beginning how to copy a single file. Uh, through the secure copy command. This is a CP command. It takes the same parameters as a normal CP command, which copies data locally from one target location to another target location. SCP is uh, the easiest tool to copy. Let us take a look whatever we have here. Let us copy everything here all the files, so scp minus r dot, and we copy it to server four dot ssh user. Okay, just to ssh user. This is how you type it now, because ssh user is not user. It is the host name that we used in config file. And now we tell where to copy, just backup. Expected file name. Okay. No such file directory. We need to create such a directory at first. Okay. So this way we connect to SSH to our SSH user to remote and execute this command. 
permission denied. Hmm. Okay, everything is fine. So previously we did make dear mine make dear comment only, I believe. Now we're executing this entire comment. And this other, this thing, once again, it appears because of port forwarding, dynamic forwarding. We just ignore this output. So let us copy data. That's it. All the data that SCP actually thinks we have is copied. Why didn't we copy all the files? Because all the files, they start with dot, which means for hidden files. And we ask to copy everything star. Star substitutes everything except hidden files. Well, how to copy entire folder? Copies files between hosts and network. It is strange that it just doesn't copy this folder Probably like that. Indeed, so slash root copied entire contents of our folder to the backup. Now let us SSH to the SSH user. I type bash every time. So we have this backup folder now here. And inside, we have at first three files that we copied at first. And then we copy the root here, directory. We see only three files once again, but simply because we didn't type show everything. And now we see that we have an entire copy of home folder of the root. Everything was copied. The same way we can copy in opposite direction. So I exited my connection, control D twice, and now I am again at root. And I will I would like to copy this backup into a backup of backup <laughs> here. So I do SCP and I would like to copy something from remote server. I'm saying recursively copy all the folders and so on of SSH user, backup, copy this folder and save it here in backup too. So we are asking to copy folder backup on remote server in the home folder recursively and place it here. We are again copying lots of data. We have backup to folder now. And once again, we have the same <coughs> setting of files. And we have in the root folder, we also have entire home folder of a root user. SCP is very simple, intuitive, just like copy, and it will copy everything and overwrite everything. So if you were copying huge data, huge amount of data, and something happened to your network connection, then SCP will just, if you run SCP once again, it will start copying, it will start the entire process of copying once again. It will not take a look at whatever is already there. It will just start entire process of copying once again, ignoring that these files are already there. For this uh, reason, there is a program called rsync which synchronizes two folders, remote source folder and target folder. So you see here, our sync, then source, and then destination in the simplest way. Let us try, let us try copying it. I, I myself never used our sync, simply because 
I never played with lots of huge amount of files. It was usually just one file, but of incredibly large size. And if it fails in the middle, you have to copy it once again. Usually it didn't fail. But nevertheless, when you are copying huge amount of data to your remote server where you would like to perform some computations, it might take several minutes, for example. If it is several minutes, you can launch SCP once again. But if it takes a day, then you have to do it with Earthsync. Sometimes Earthsync helps you doing the following thing. On your local machine, you have a bunch of files. You copy them with help of Earthsync to the remote server. You process these files. New files are created. You don't have to dig which files these are. You just call Earthsync in opposite direction. Earthsync finds all the differences, all the newer files, and will copy on the newer files. Something that is newer, uh, something that was not there before will be copied. So let us try <coughs> Earthsync locally. You can actually call Earthsync not only remotely, but also locally. Earthsync and some parameters, which just don't ask me. A is some standard parameter that ignores certain options. V here stands for purpose. It will tell you more information. And P stands for uh, copy with permissions. So if you have certain files that are executable without these options, they will lose this property. You will have to change property like executability, do ch mod plus x once again for all the executable files. Where is this file for permissions? Actually, for executability, where is x, as I believe, which stands for copy executable files as executable files. But let us do it like that. And then we copy from backup folder to backup free. Oh, it was too fast. Uh, it was too fast. Let us remove portion of files. So I'm trying to sync once again. And as you see, did, it didn't copy anything. There were no files that were copying. So these two folders were synchronized. So rsync, calling this rsync from source backup to into destination backup three, didn't do anything. Let's now spoil backup three. So we go to backup three and let's remove one file, std.r. Okay. We get out of here and we try to call rsync once again. We see that there was a single file that was copied. So this is the simplest way how to call this rsync. There are different additional options and it will be your homework to, def uh, to find them out. It actually checks uh, if your source is newer than destination and uh, it copies in this situation. If your destination is newer, it will not copy. So let us just go through it. So we copied it. Let us now change destination source file. So backup two is the source and we change stdd.r and add something. So now stdd.r this file in the source folder backup to is newer. It has a later timestamp. Then our sync copies it. It takes a look at the timestamp. However, if I change <coughs> the same file in the destination folder, so I changed uh, backup three, which is destination. Mm. So it just overrides something that is not strange. <coughs> Probably there is a, an option that takes a look at timestamps. This is how I remember it. So it was possible long time ago when I used it once to not override newer files. Indeed. So probably there is such an option. I already forgot about it. But right now, with this 
simple parameters, it just overrides everything that is not equal. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, now we are connecting, we are moving this backup to the SSH user. And then in the SSH user, let's call it backup four. So once again, we are, copy, we are calling this rsync source is the local and target is remote. So let us SSH to SSH user, call bash and take a look. Indeed, we have backup for folder with all the data inside. It is copied from one place to another place. And if we remove one file, update it. So for example, we change timestamp of STD out. We disconnect from the remote server. We are once again at the root user, which stands for local. And we try to synchronize source and remote directories. We see once again that only this STD out was updated. Now let us do the opposite move. We're copying data from the remote to a local server. And here it is, backup five. So once again, rsync, if you would like to copy and all the files in a single folder and something happens during, we have many small files and something happens during copying, if you launch this program once again, it will see which files were already copied and copy all the rest. So if you need to move lots of data in terms of a large amount of files, then Ersync helps you. Okay, so where is other standard way how to actually get data on not only on remote machine, but also on your local machine, it's called wget. It will download a file or whatever located at web address. So just when you download something using your web browser, you know what is the address, you type it in and you download it. So you download certain file using HTTPS or HTTP protocol, you just type entire address. I don't know, disk, Yandex, ru, and then file name. If you have a link like that, then it will download it. But unfortunately, Yandex disk doesn't allow such links. It will always lead to web interface. And for this purpose, there is command called their clone. I just heard of it, which works with Dropbox, which works with Google Drive and so on. And you can download data from these cloud services, but I never used it. It is up to you to try it. So, this is it about copying. Now let us try to play with uh, running certain comments. So now, why would now we would like I would like to I would like you to see a problem, a standard problem that many users who are in using SSH connection intuitively many users, they do not know how to solve this problem. So the problem is the following. When you connect to a remote server, there appears a certain process. And while you are connected, this process is running. Once you disconnect, this process is killed. If you run some program, which runs for a long time, and your connection is lost, you have a disconnection, then your corresponding service, corresponding process on the remote server is killed, and all the child processes, meaning your long computation is killed. So every it will happen with remote serv servers. So let me, I cannot show it on, unfortunately I tried it within Docker, and Docker doesn't have this problem. Once you connect to a local user with help of SSH and disconnect, your long running program will not be killed, unfortunately. So for this, I need to use my connection to some real server. And this is, uh, I believe this is visible more or less. 
Okay, so at first let us connect to some machine which is called Noisy here. I have set up my configuration to connect to it. So let us run some command. So I have prepared a script, script.sh. So what does this script do? When executed, it will print process ID to the standard output. Then it will sleep for three seconds. After that, when finished sleeping, it will output complete to a file called complete dot and process ID. Let us run it here. So there is no file like that here. Let us just run it. So this is the process ID. We wait for three seconds. We exit and we see new file, which is complete dot process ID. Let us cut this file complete. However, if I run this, so there is a way how to run your scripts in the background. You just add ampersand. You see there is process ID here. So this is the output of my script and this is the output of uh, bash. It creates a new process, background process with uh, script.sh running. We see that this process is done, finished. And let's take a look. So indeed we have a new file, complete.36, okay. We have the same inside. Let us remove these files. However, if we launch this script in the background mode, where is my arrow, okay. If I launch this script in the background mode and I immediately disconnect from the server, there will be no such file created. So let us try it. So I press enter and disconnect. Let us try to connect again. Okay, it was created. Let us sleep for more. So we we'll sleep not three seconds, but 10 seconds. Now we launch this script again and exit immediately. Now we connect. So we wait a little bit because we need to wait for 10 seconds now. Oh, it's completed. So unfortunately, this process was not killed. <laughs> so yesterday I was playing with it and this process is very war killed. But uh, right now, for some reason, they are not killed. Okay, there is huge chance that your long running program, if there is disconnection, that it will be killed. To have this problem solved, there is special command, which is called no hub, which stands for no hang up. If there is a disconnection or something similar happens and you are disconnected from your SSH, SSH connection is broken, then corresponding process will not be killed. It will be running and running and running. So this is the command that you need to remember. When you connect a remote server and you need to launch something for a long time, one of the possible ways to do this is no hub, no hang up. So we have no hub, script.sh, and then ampersand to run it in background. Okay, so no hub told us that it ignores input and outputs everything into no hub.out. It means that when this program finishes, I can take a look at the file no hub.out. Simply speaking, no hub uh, gets all the standard output that your command usually prints when you are disconnected and saves, stores it in nohub.out. Anytime you log in, you see entire standard output. So let us connect, take a look. So there is indeed nohub.out. And we have it. So our output, which is process ID, is stored here. So if you have long running process that outputs something, 
you will have it in nohub.out. So let me once again tell you what is the script. So this script prints process ID to the standard output, then it slips for 10 seconds, and then it outputs word complete into a file named complete.processAD. It is possible to execute such a command externally from the local server. So I do SSH noisy, and then I tell what is the command to execute. So no hub, and then script.sh. So you see this process, SSH connected to the remote server and launched this no hub. If I disconnect, okay, let's, if I disconnect and then connect later, I will see a file named complete dot this number. Here it is. So it's finished. Let's cut no hub put out. Okay, it was not updated because we were not running it from within remote server. For this, we need. So if you have some long running program and you don't want to wait for it, you pass an additional flag SSH minus F. It will actually run your command, which is no hub dot script sh in background immediately so you see now it printed something for me and then later it will save file ssh noisy base six five one eight here it is this file so we run no such files If you would like to store some, if you would like to redirect standard output immediately and standard error immediately, then you just prolong this command as standard output goes to std.out and standard error goes to std.r. And you will see no output of, uh, so previously, once I entered this command, I got a, number which is process id on the remote server it was printed here locally now i have redirected the standard output to a file so nothing is printed on my site but this ssh noisy now it contains it previously contained these files std.out and std.r this is where process id and indeed there is such file and std.r is empty because there were no errors. Okay, this is the program called NoHub. If you would like to launch long running process, you call NoHub, then your program, and then ampersand, and then you can disconnect. This is one of the possible ways. There is other way. You use so-called screen command. And screen command, let me probably try it here. I do SSH to the SSH user bash, and then let me take a look at where is such com screen not found. Okay, we need to install it. I disconnect, get back to a root user, and do apt install screen, and just let us install it. This is the command apt install screen. This command creates uh, a separate uh, connection for you. So it's like uh, your, this command screen, it saves your screen, simply speaking. And when you disconnect from your server, this screen is saved with all your commands, with your history. It's like you launch another terminal inside a terminal. 
and this second terminal is not killed. But that's it. And you might have many different terminals. So let us now apt install screen. So now we go to the SSH user, bash, and then screen. Okay. It tells us something. Let's press enter to exit. And now we are inside screen. So it's like a terminal inside a terminal that will not be killed if we tell it so. So how to exit this? You can press Ctrl D or just exit. This command will stop this additional terminal inside terminal. Screen is terminating. This is what you see. There is no terminal assigned terminal anymore. OK, screen. It is created. Now we can launch some program like sleep 20 in the background, for example. I already forgot how to get out of screen. Control A D. OK. So I pressed certain comments and I detached from this screen. It simply means that I can attach to it later. So this screen is running. I can even disconnect from the user. So I disconnect it. But this process is not killed. It is just there with low priority probably and so on if there is no program running. If there is a program running, of course, it is eating resources. So I am connecting back, doing bash. And now I would like to see screen help. I would like to attach back to a, okay, minus R, reattach to a detach screen process. Okay, screen minus R. Here it is. I am back. Although I have disconnected all the history of commands, entire picture of the terminal, entire screen is saved. That's why it is called screen. You can have several different sessions with screen. For example, in one session, you're running one program. In another session, you're running other program. This is useful sometimes. And then you disconnect from the server, but everything is running. And when later you come back, you see all the comments, you see um, all the history of the output, and it is not lost unless you detach, unless you terminate this screen. So to detach from the screen, you press, if you are here, Control A, nothing happens, and then you press D. It stands to, for detach from screen. Do not kill it. We can also create another screen. Without options, just press screen, and it is another screen. So here we just echo screen two. Once again, I press Control A, D. I am detached. Now I would like to list how many screens I have. So screen minus L probably. Nope. So I press Control D to exit. Now I need to browse for help. How to list all the <clears throat> login mode? Okay. So I was always using only a single screen, but I know that it's very useful to have several screens if you need to process data in a different manner and run different uh, scripts for that. Okay, let me Google how to... Screen list screens. So there is a possibility to give screen a name. It's 
screen minus ls. I found that, but I didn't believe it is like that. Yes, indeed, so screen minus ls. You can actually, when you run screen, you can give it a name, minus t, title, and then it will appear here instead of this something. This way you will see, let us screen minus t, let's call it script. Control A, D, we detached, screen minus ls, it doesn't appear, okay. Okay, it doesn't matter that much, but I remember it was possible to change this to something human readable and then just attach properly. So we to attach minus R and then you copy this. Here it is. I'm on screen two. Control A D. I have detached screen minus LS to other one. Screen reattach in script. So you can, let's say, cycle through this control AD, and you have access to your old commands that are not, uh, that are still running. You can run long process. You need to, for example, to copy lots of data in one screen, you are copying this data. In another screen, you are editing file for example, and then you exit one screen, go to another just to check if there are problems with copying, if you need to relaunch this uh, sync again, if there was disconnection, or if everything is fine. You don't care how long it will copy, you just do you whatever you need to do next. Okay, let's have 10 minute break.
Okay, let us continue. So last possibility to have your computations actually computing something. So we studied no hub, we studied screen that can compute something in background while you <laughs> play with other things. There is other possibility and it's called terminal multiplexer. So it is Tmax. It is also not installed in our Docker. So let us install it. We we'll get back to our root. So we disconnect it from the remote server. We get back to our root and we install it. So we install Tmox, terminal multiplexer. You will need to get to the root user. We need to get back to our root user. So disconnect from the SSH user and do apt install Tmox. So it is installed. Tmax is a screen-like program, but it is more advanced. It allows you not only to have a single terminal, you can have many terminals adjusted in a way you like. So Tmax, you can, it, you can run it locally on your root user. So we have some information here. We are on initial or zero uh, terminal. <clears throat> and we can dis disconnect from it. So, sorry. In screen, we had to type Control A D. Here we use Control B D for detach. Control B D. Detached. So you see, we detached from session zero. If we call Tmox once again, we are on session one now. Once again, control B, D. Detached from session one. So let us get some help. Okay, probably it's man, Tmax. <clears throat> Terminal multiplexer. And we're looking for listing all the possible. Okay. Let us reattach. So to reattach, we press something like that. And we are attached to first session. <coughs> SSS, I will. So control B and D for detach. This is what I used to attach back. So. I myself prefer using screen because it is simpler and I'm not using all the power of Tmax. So I have to dig into parameters of Tmax. But main feature here is that you can create several windows, let's say inside the Tmax. So I'm back to session zero with help of Tmax minus T zero. Okay, attach to a terminal zero, to a session zero. Here, I can create a new window, control B, C. There are windows, so we are on 
session zero, there are windows, zero and one. It's like tabs. So I can press Control T in my terminal, Command T, and I have another window, terminal window. Terminal multiplexer was doing something similar initially. So I can now press Control B, zero. I am back to terminal zero. So echo session zero, terminal zero. Now I press Control B one, and I am on different window. So instead of having different screens, I can have a single Tmax connection with all these screens appear in here. So I'm on session zero and I have some windows open. Zero window is just bash. First window is also bash and I'm currently here. This is it. And aha, uh -huh. session zero, terminal one. I am typing again, control B zero, control B one. And I can switch it like that. So control B, C creates new window. <coughs> control B, D will be. If you would like to disconnect from it, to detach such that it is still, it is still there. It is control B and then D. So control B and D without control. Control B starts all the commands for the Tmax. Control A starts all the commands for screen. And then you press certain buttons <coughs> and Tmax or screen, they understand it and interpret. Let's connect back to Tmax to the zero session and we see that we have three different windows. So Tmax is just a term, as it says, terminal multiplexer, and it is useful on a remote server if you need several windows. I myself prefer having several separate connections, like here I, I open several terminals, do SSH in every terminal, and then in every terminal there is different SSH connection with certain things going on. I just don't like the uh, idea of Tmax like that because I have a single connection. If something happens with this single connection, it is just broken. While if you have two different connections, it might happen that white one connection is broken, another connection is okay. Some, for example, you have Wi-Fi, you are on Wi-Fi, and for like five or ten seconds, Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is not working. You have disconnection. In one uh, SSH connection, you were copying data, it will stop. And it will understand that there is a broke, so-called broken pipe or whatever, and data will not be copied. But for, the, for another terminal SSH connection, where you was just sitting and doing nothing, it will not understand anything because no command went to the remote server. And after your Wi-Fi is back, you can still type something in the second terminal without this connection. This is just simply because I had too many disconnections some at certain points of time. So no hub is the simplest way to not let your program stop. Screen helps you save your progress and Tmax is just more advanced. It is up to you which way you choose. So any questions? Now we'll start with certain lab or homework problems. So here are other questions. Let us, I'm asking you to follow, to ask, uh, okay. 
This is a question number one. Please generate a new key. We did it last time when we generated a key for the GitHub account, but we generated a key with the RSA encryption. Please try to generate another kind of key. The comment is SSH key again that will generate a new key for you. So you can open your canvas and download lecture notes. This way you don't have to take a look at these small letters and just copy certain stuff from the PDF. So, and change passphrase of this key. Try to find the proper parameter for the SSH key again to change passphrase. So let me start with first part, A, generate, well, to kill terminal, just press Ctrl D. So I exited Tmax, just exit command Ctrl D. The same with other session. <clears throat> so we would, we wanted to generate a new key, key again with type of this type, but this type <coughs> and save it as a new key like that. So it asks me for a passphrase, but I'll keep it empty. Let's take a look. So I have created actually two files. One is private, this one, and another one is public key. And I forgot actually about this parameter. <coughs> this number of bits. Let's take a look how to. Minus B bits, okay. <coughs> Minus B for number of bits. So type is this type, number of bits is 1024 and file is this. 
I overwrite existing with empty passphrase. <clears throat> but now I would like to actually update passphrase of this identity file. Minus P for, the, for this file. Since passphrase was empty, it assumes like this assumed like zero password, no password. I need to M <coughs> add something. So let's type one or and repeat this passphrase. Well, my identification is saved. Okay, so let us, sorry, have some troubles. So we changed passphrase of this key. Now, once again, try to do a dry run of writing new SSH key to a remote. It is a dry run, so there is an option to the SSH copy ID command that will tell you what it will do, but without actually doing anything. And please add this new key to the remote, to our remote. Change passphrase <clears throat> minus p to change passphrase of this key. If I would like to change passphrase once again, it asks me for the old passphrase. And then I can enter a new one. Passphrase is actually needed only once per login to make use of your <clears throat> SSH key. So to have a dry run of the writing of, of extending our ID to external to remote server, we do SSH copy ID minus N for dry run. We use identity file, which is new key dot pub because we copy actually public key, not private key. And for this, we use SSH user. We can already connect to SSH user without any password because we did set up passwordless access, but this way we are adding another key. That's it, it just tells me there will be one new key installed, no password is asked and so on. <clears throat> but it tells me that it thinks that all the keys are already there, which is strange because it's just generated it. Let's enforce it with minus F option. Probably I need to type it minus F at first, then minus I. So one key was copied. Now we can take a look at authorized keys of the SSH user. Slash home. SSH user, dot SSH, authorized keys. So now we have two keys there. This is the previous one. 
RSA key, this is the new key. <coughs> and now we can use both keys to enter this remote server. To use newly generated key, we need to update our config file. So since although it is not written here, please update. Who actually tried to create config file? Okay, then please try to update your, yes, question. So question is, why do we need different keys? First of all, you have different remote servers. You might have different key for every different server. Why different types? Well, as you saw, there are different amount of so-called digits here and different uh, amount of time that someone would need to spend to hack you. That's it. So you choose the most protected or in most encrypted key. Standard is RSA. Just type SSH key again, minus T. Where is it? <clears throat> minus T RSA. As far as I remember, it is default one. You can even remove this minus T RSA and it will generate you RSA key. And it will have lots of digits and it will be harder to hack. But I am not an expert in encryption. I cannot tell you more. I cannot tell you what is the difference between these different types. <clears throat> but generally, people are using RSA. You might use more bits, for example, to be protect, better protected. So if we would like to connect to SSH without a password with a newly created key, then we just edit .ssh config. And here, we change this file. It was new key for me because I renamed. But now we have new key. Here it is. So <clears throat> I have this new key and now I will actually use this key to connect. So I'm doing SSH, SSH user. Now I need to enter passphrase for this key that I just typed. Okay, that was a mistake. I was pressing the wrong button two times. And in the end, in the end, I managed to get access. I get out of the remote server. I try to do SSH again, and it asks for my passphrase again. There is so-called SSH agent that actually stores all your keys and you can add your key to this agent. And when you add this key to the agent, you just type this passphrase once. Then anytime you do SSH to remote server, this passphrase is not asked anymore. So it's just a protection, additional protection of your public, uh, of your private key. <clears throat> Okay, I believe that all the ta other tasks uh, you can do yourself. I will actually update them and upload today, I believe. And I will make this also possible, I believe, today uh, for, for today's lecture. So thank you. If you have questions, please come and we will discuss. <clears throat>